All right, we are beginning a new series today on uh, the book of Jeremiah. We're going to do a book study. And um, I wanted to start out with a question. How popular is it to call sin just that, sin? How popular would you be if you warned others about the deception of sin? And that if we don't deal with the sin that is present in our lives, then we are on a dangerous path in life, a path where we may be standing in line to receive the righteous discipline of the Lord. A pastor downstate opened up his series on Jeremiah with this quote, and I liked what he said. One thing is sure when you read through the Bible honestly and objectively, and that is God never looks favorably on sin, and he does not let his people get away with it or overlook it forever. If God's people don't do something about sin, he will. If there was ever a topical study or subject that the church in America as a whole wanted to dismiss or set aside, I believe it would be this topic right here, the seriousness of sin. It's no secret that we live in a society, a culture, a nation that has rejected God. Um, recently, I went to foxnews.com and I typed in the search bar there, God, to see what articles would appear within the last year. And the first article that came to my attention was from a couple of months ago and had the following title, Eric Swalwell, Democratic Representative of California, said that God is a woman while discussing Trump's impeachment trial. The second article that caught my attention was from a month ago, or a couple months ago now, um, and it had this as its title, California proposes curriculum with chanting name of Aztec God who accepts human sacrifice. I mean, can you imagine children in a, in a public school setting chanting the name of Aztec gods? And finally, the third article was from a, a, a little over a year ago where Franklin Graham um, reflected on the absence of God at the DNC in 2020 ahead of the D.C. prayer march. And I mean, these are just a few of the articles that I came across in a very short amount of time but what we can conclude is that sin has been embraced, it's been accepted in society, it's coddled, and it has turned into the norm in more ways than one. I think that we can become, in essence, callous to it rather than broken by it. Uh, J. Vernon McGee wrote his commentary on Jeremiah, and uh, he's an old-timer. Uh, J. Vernon McGee, I love his stuff. Um, but over 30 years ago, he wrote something, he made an observation that I felt really spoke into where we are today. And keep in mind, he wrote this over 30 years ago. He says, this was his observation, quote, You and I are living at a time which is probably like the time of Jeremiah. Ours is a great nation today, and we have accomplished many things. We have gone to the moon, we have produced atom bombs, although we are a strong nation with Within is the same corruption which will actually carry us down to dismemberment and disaster. It is coming, my friend. Revolution may be around the corner. I know that what I am saying is not popular today. We don't hear anything like this through the media. Instead, we have panels of experts who discuss how we are going to improve society and how we can work out our problems. Today, God is left out of the picture totally, absolutely left out. If the Bible is mentioned, it is mentioned with a curled lip by some unbeliever. The ones who are believers are pushed aside. I know that. That is why I say to you that I think we are in very much the same position that Jeremiah was in. For that reason, I know this book is going to have a message for us today, end quote. That really speaks into our time, I felt. So as we begin our study on the book of Jeremiah, it's become increasingly clear to me that this, this book in, in the Bible is absolutely relevant for the times in which we find ourselves. And so we're going to begin a study on this incredible book that from the past speaks into our day today. Well, in the book of Jeremiah, God is seen as patient towards his people, yet holy. He declared judgment and appealed to his people to turn back to him before it was too late. And there was a great object lesson for us, and it's found in Jeremiah chapter 18. I'd like for you to turn there with me. Jeremiah chapter 18. In the Old Testament, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, 
you'll find Je Jeremiah there. And in the first four verses, it explains that a vessel can be repaired while wet. Okay, verse eight, chapter 18, verse 1, says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. The potter was able to remake the vessel as long as that um, pottery was, was wet, um, and it would have a purpose, it would be useful. Um, but if the vessel dried out, it would, would take on a form that would be fit only for the garbage can. Verse, uh, chapter 19, verses 10 and 11 says, Then you are to break the jar in the sight of the men who accompany you and say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Just so will I break this people in this city, even as one breaks a potter's vessel which cannot again be repaired. The message was clear. There was no doubt in the mind of the listener as to what it was that God had been warning his people about. The window for the people living in Judah really um, to acknowledge God um, and, and as they were living wickedly, um, that window would come to a clo close at some point. In fact, one of the key verses in the book of Jeremiah is Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 23 through 24. And I have it right up here for you. Jeremiah 7, 23 through 24. We're going to be kind of in and out of verses today, um, but uh, uh, just as an introduction lesson. Um, but chapter 7, verses 23 through 24 says, But this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. And you will walk in all the way which I command you, that it will be well with you. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in their own counsels and in the stubbornness of their evil hearts and went backward and not forward. As a nation, Judah had backslidden into sin and needed to hear from God. They did. As you've, as you've guessed, this is an introductory lesson into the book of Jeremiah. And since we're going to be studying the book of Jeremiah, we're going to be looking at some basic elements today that will really help us to understand this book. We're going to look at some basic elements. Typically what I do with an introduction lesson is we'll look at who wrote the book, um, we'll give some historical setting. I'm not going to do that today. I wanted to um, look at a couple of questions in, in our time together that will really help us to grasp this book as a whole. In fact, we're, in our time together, we're going to answer three questions Three questions, and the first question will be, what are some basic outlines given for the book of Jeremiah? What are some basic outlines given for the book of Jeremiah? This is a big book. We've got 52 chapters, right? So I think that that will help us to kind of get a, get a sense into what this book is about as we look at that outline today. Uh, we want to ask ourselves a second question, how should we view the book of Jeremiah? And the third question that we will ask in our time together will be, why should we study the book of Jeremiah? Why even study it? So let's begin. We're going to begin with this first question today. What are some basic outlines given for the book of Jeremiah? What are some basic outlines given for the book of Jeremiah? Now, when someone gives us an outline for a book, an outline will be helpful in viewing the overall plan and purpose of the book as a whole. And the best and most help, helpful outline that I found broke up this book into four parts. And I, I wanted you to have this in your notes. Um, I, I think that this outline is very helpful. The call of Jeremiah is seen in chapter 1, verses 1 through 19. Then we have the prophecies of Judah in chapter 2, verses 1 through 45, verse 5. Then in um, number three is the prophecies to the Gentiles in chapter 46 and chapter 51 through chapter 51. And then finally 52 is the fall of Jerusalem. So we have the call of Jeremiah, the prophecies of Judah, the prophecies 
to the Gentiles and the fall of Jerusalem. So I, I believe that'll be very helpful. This, in my opinion, is the easiest way, I think, to understand the book as a whole. And it really puts forth for the reader a basic overview of the book of Jeremiah. Uh, J. J. Vernon McGee broke down his outline into seven parts. And Warren Wearsby broke uh, the book, his book down into uh, 13 chapters out of his commentary, Be Decisive. So we find ourselves somewhere in the middle for the outline that we're going to work through in our time together. And I've, um, each week, you, you know the drill. We've got uh, two sets of notes in the back. And um, what we're going to have for you each week will be um, really the outline stapled to a bibliography, what um, resources we're using for this study. Um, and then you're going to have in that second sheet or that second stack of notes will be the, the weekly notes um, for you as we go through this study. So I'd encourage you, fill those out, put them in a binder. Um, it'll be a great study for you, a great resource to have. All right, that leads us to the second question today. How should we view the book of Jeremiah? How should we view the book of Jeremiah? Let's be honest for a minute. <laughs> Reading through the book of Jeremiah is challenging, isn't it? It's hard to understand. Um, have you ever read through the book of Jeremiah and found yourself maybe confused by um, the, the timing of the events found in the book? Perhaps that's, perhaps that's you. I know for me that has been the case. Maybe you're puzzled as to the structure of the book. Uh, the New Testament scholar... Robert P. Carroll said the following, quote, I am still of the opinion that the book of Jeremiah is a very difficult, confused, and confusing text. Writing the commentary on Jeremiah was for me a Dantean experience, a journey through a wood darker than I, I had ever imagined or would or could be. However, I'm not surprised by his conclusion because Robert Carroll mainly viewed the book of Jeremiah to be a work of fiction. You know that's not going to be my stance uh, on this book. Nonetheless, uh, many have struggled to understand the layout or the structure of this book. Um, don't read the book of Jeremiah uh, believing it to be linear in the sense that the order of it is chronological by nature. That's naturally how we read uh, books. We see things as linear. Uh, we saw that in our study of, um, let's say, Nehemiah, uh, Esther. It's chronological. Daniel chapters 1 through 6. That isn't going to be the case here. Instead, what we have when we come to Jeremiah, it's better understood to see it as an anthology. So I believe Jeremiah is compiled in the sense that it is an anthology. Jonathan Murphy, in his um, in his article, The Quest for the Structure of the Book of Jeremiah, wrote that as an anthology, the book of Jeremiah has been carefully structured to present a reoccurring theological message of judgment and hope for God's exiled people. So each of the sections of the study that I've laid out for us represents aspects of this anthology. If we view this book as that, as an anthology, I believe we will... Uh, better understand the book, and it's going to make a lot more sense to us as we carefully walk through this book together. For example, when we get to chapters 46 through 51, um, if we're looking at this book as a chronological book, we might say that Jeremiah wrote those um, prophecies towards the end of his ministry, right? Because those prophecies are given at the end of the book. But he received those prophecies in 605 B.C., which wasn't, was nowhere near the end of his ministry by a long shot. Um, Peter Craig wrote that what we are dealing with then in reading the book of Jeremiah is a work that is essentially an anthology, or more precisely, an anthology of anthologies. But whereas a modern anthology provides guidance to its readers, by extensive use of titles, notes, and headings, only a few such aids to reading have survived in Jeremiah. So, then the question, why has this book been compiled in this way? <laughs> why is it an anthology? Uh, this isn't an easy answer. Um, all of my commentaries that I've listed, 
that I have listed in the bibliography um, that I saw did not give a straight answer uh, for that question. But I believe the answer is a logical one. Uh, the climax of the book is in chapter 52, the destruction of Jerusalem. And this anthology is, uh, is, is structured in such a way where chapters 2 through 45 focus on the judgments towards Judah and chapters 46 through 51 focus on judgments toward the Gentile nations. So the reason I believe for this arrangement be, be, being an anthology is that it has been logically structured to point towards that climactic event of Jerusalem's destruction in chapter 52. I believe that the difficulties come when interpreting the structure for this book will be deflated if we simply take the text at face value, if we do. Uh, we must take God at his word, and I believe there is great reward when we do so. Also, before we look into the third question, there is a lens into which we must view this book, and I believe that lens is found in chapter 1. So I'm going to ask you to turn there with me. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10. We have the commissioning of Jeremiah, his calling in chapter 1 within these verses. God is speaking to Jeremiah, and in verse 10, the Lord says, in fact, I'm going to back up to verse 9, Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Within this commissioning, we find the agenda for the book of Jeremiah as an anthology. Um, God's prophet has been called to preach to the Jews who are living in Judah and in Jerusalem, and he's called to preach judgment to them. And uh, there is uh, judgment and there is restoration. In the book of Jeremiah, there is grace, there is righteousness, there is fear, but there is hope, there is great hope. Uh, these themes, they run through this book, and God's gracious promise of hope and restoration are given to God's people in spite of their own personal shortcomings. For uh, from within Jeremiah's personal commissioning, he was given the task to preach judgment and destruction. Um, his message was to be heeded as it would uh, come to fruition in the last chapter of the book, chapter 52. Uh, and, and so we must see this book as an anthology within the bookends of Jeremiah's calling in chapter 1 and um, with what he would prophesy of concerning the fall of Jerusalem uh, by the Babylonians in chapter 52. All right, that brings us to the third question then. We're going to end out our time by asking, why should we study the book of Jeremiah? Why should we study the book of Jeremiah? And there are many reasons to study this book, but I'll give us three reasons for our, our introduction. The first reason for studying the book of Jeremiah is because Jeremiah is an inspired book. It is an inspired book. There are, how many inspired books out of the Bible? 66 inspired books. Good. Uh, this is one of those inspired books. 2 Timothy 3.16 reminds us that all Scripture is inspired by God, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And verse 17 have we forgotten it? Verse 17, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Do we believe that? Do we believe that? I understand that the majority of the book of Jeremiah is written to the Jews, specifically to the Jews living in Judah. So we might say, well, what about us? We are church age believers. We're living in a different dispensation, right? Well, God has given us this book. So I believe it is worthy of our time by that fact alone. By that fact alone. It stands as the second largest book in the Old Testament, with the first being the Psalms. And uh, Jeremiah is viewed as a, he's viewed as a major prophet. Um, but as we will see in the near future, this book gives us a tremendous insight into the nature of God, 
his uh, relationship to sin and, and what he expects from those who belong to him. Unfortunately for many living in Judah, they were being swayed by the false prophets who were telling the people what they wanted to hear. One verse I love from this book comes from Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29. You've heard it before. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer which shatters rock. That is exactly what Jeremiah would bring to the people. He would bring the word. What the people living in Judah needed to hear was the truth. The truth about God, the truth about their sin, the truth about what was to come if they didn't turn back to God. We would also do well to remember that Daniel took the time to study this book, a quality that was true of Daniel's public life as well as as his private life was that of godliness. And from our study of that book, we learn that Daniel was a man of prayer as well as being a, a man of the Word. And in the ninth chapter of Daniel, we find him personally studying portions of Jeremiah, we remember that, right? All the way back in chapter 9 of uh, the book of Daniel, he's studying portions of Jeremiah's prophecies that had been given to him by God. So Jeremiah is an inspired book by God and is absolutely profitable for any who would take the time to understand it. The second reason for studying the book of Jeremiah is because Jeremiah is a book that glorifies God himself. Jeremiah is a book that glorifies God himself. God is sovereign, and God. Um, and what we are going to see throughout the study is that we, we are all accountable to God. The nation of Israel is accountable to him. We're also going to find wicked pagan nations are also accountable to God, okay? as well as every individual. Every individual is accountable to him. When I was studying for ordination, one verse that stuck out to me Uh, was Jeremiah 32, verse 17. I love this verse. It's just a beautiful verse. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth. By your great power and by your outstretched arm, nothing is too difficult for you. That speaks of the power of God. Um, All right, and uh, God has all the power in the universe to accomplish his own perfect will. This is a book that elevates God and properly pictures him as he is. God is good, He is loving, He is righteous, and He is just. He is just. Jeremiah 9, verse 24 says, But let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Because He is righteous. God will not sit idly by uh, while his people choose to run towards the world without first dealing with their own sin. As a loving heavenly father, he will in fact chase after those who belong to him and he will punish them for their sin. Hebrews 12.10 actually says that God disciplines us, grace age believers, for our good so that we may share in his holiness. And he does. But if we're honest with ourselves, we want to hear a nice message, don't we? We all want to hear a nice message. As human beings, we're drawn to that. We're drawn to feel-good sermons and Bible studies where very little is said about sin, where very little is said about hell, where very little is said about God's righteousness, and where very little is said about God's wrath, right? We don't like to hear all of that. I was recently listening to a popular YouTube, uh, or actually a popular preacher here in the States, speak on the love of the Father. And uh, I noted in that video from YouTube, uh, everyone was uh, praising the preacher, just praising the preacher, praising the preacher. And, uh, and, and, and that I need to say that wasn't the case for Jeremiah. When he brought God's word to God's people, they, for the most part, they rejected it. They did. They rejected it. In fact, they didn't want to hear from God. They were content to wallow in their sin and and to live in deception. In fact, God's people living in Judah were content to listen to false prophets who were all about feelings. And these false prophets wanted the Jews to feel good about their sin. In fact, they wanted God's people to feel good about their deception But what the Jews living in Judah failed to see was that they were in line to receive God's wrath 
and God's anger as a nation. Which brings us to the third reason for studying this book. We should study the book of Jeremiah because Jeremiah is a book that is relevant for us. I believe that. I believe this is a book for our time. Uh, Christianity in America has shifted in in a major way uh, from the truth of God's Word. Today, sin is celebrated and esteemed. In fact, if you're going to stand for truth and for that which is biblical, then you, you run the risk of being canceled in our culture. In fact, you even run the risk of being canceled in the church. You do. Openly embracing sin has been accepted by many in society. And what was previously seen as unacceptable and morally wrong is embraced with arms wide open. And what the book of Jeremiah teaches is that God will have the final word and that he has something to say about sin. Jeremiah's message was that if God's people didn't turn back to him, they were in line to receive God's righteous judgment. Jeremiah, he watched society crumble around him. He personally witnessed God's people turning from the truth of God's word and he saw the failure of political and religious leaders. I mean, Jeremiah was living in a time that greatly resembles the days in which we find ourselves. Do you remember what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? Let's go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Jeremiah is a book that is relevant for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to finish this up here, reading verses 1 through 5. The Apostle Paul says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from the spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them God was not well pleased, for they laid low in the wilderness. And then in verse 6, I actually put verse 6 up here on the PowerPoint. You can follow along in your Bibles though. Now, now these things happened as examples for us so that we would not uh, crave evil things as they also craved. They are examples to us. Um, as we look at the examples set forth in Jeremiah and, and the Jews that they set um, living in Judah, in Jerusalem. They, the, the events of what transpired there serves as an example. Verse 7 says, and let's read through verse 10, Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and, the, and they stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents nor grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. And then we come to verse 11. I have it up here. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction. How about that? For the church-age believer, uh, there is some good um, instruction here for us. The Apostle Paul clearly made this point that as we study the Old Testament, And as we peer into the nation of Israel today, though we've not replaced Israel as grace age believers, we will see that we have a lot to learn from their example. And we will find that there will be some instruction for us. Hebrews 13.8 says this. I love this verse. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So the message is clear. If God punished his people in the Old Testament because they were unwilling to deal with their sin or even to recognize it, then we would be foolish to think that God is smiling upon us if we are living life with unconfessed sin before God and possibly before others. But as we study this book, we're going to find that God is over-the-top patient, over-the-top patient with those who belong to him. A child of God who's been running from God for years can confess that sin and can begin a walk of fellowship with Jesus Christ yet again. He isn't only a mediator. He's a high priest. That's awesome. He is a high priest. 
It doesn't matter how big the sin is. Jesus Christ is sufficient. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 through 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I love the next chapter. Um, In chapter 5, verse 9, And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal life. If you have yet to trust in Jesus Christ as Savior, the punishment for your sin will be that of eternal separation, eternal punishment in a place called hell. But I want you to know, Jesus Christ took your sin punishment upon himself. He went to the cross and he rose again. I want you to know that you can trust in Jesus Christ today to save you from your sin problem and you will be saved. As this verse says, For those who have trusted in Christ, we have been given eternal life, right? And all God's children said, amen, amen. We all have eternal life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and and for this time that we have here uh, to consider your word and to consider you and uh, your love for us. We give you praise. We thank you that you are the perfect mediator uh, between God and man. Lord, I thank you for um, sending your son to die on the cross uh, to take our sin punishment upon himself and uh, by doing so, accomplishing a work on that cross that we could not have accomplished in our own strength. Lord, if anyone here today or listening online has, has never made that decision to trust you as Savior, I pray that today would be the day they would make that decision to trust you and and would be given eternal life. We give you praise, Father. We love you and we thank you for what it is you're doing in our lives now. In your name we pray. Amen.